Next on Enviro Close Up, Seth Sheldon of ICANN and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. ICANN, which stands for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. That year, much due to the work of ICANN, the treaty was passed at the United Nations. With us, Seth Sheldon, the United Nations liaison for ICANN, and a highly experienced attorney and professor of law. Welcome, Seth. Thank you, Carl. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your interest in ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW. The big question today, Seth, uh, can the treaty, which has been described by the United Nations as a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons leading towards their total elimination become a solid reality. This may come as a shock to your some of your viewers in certain countries where, where governments and the media that listens to those governments have largely ignored this treaty, but to your question whether the treaty can become a reality, a solid reality, it, it is already a reality. Uh, while some may be ignoring it, it has proceeded with the support of the vast majority of the world. Uh, this is a treaty that was adopted in 2017 by 122 states at the United Nations. And what's more, and this is something that cannot be said for certain other treaties in this space even, that are more commonly discussed and referred to by some of the major media outlets, but this is a treaty that's already entered into force. It came about and became law once the 50th state ratified it which happened in 2021, despite the uh, pandemic, uh, it uh, entered into force in January of 2021. And so now it's law. So uh, what's more, it's the only treaty, in fact, in uh, relating to this subject that's been, and the only multi, one of the only multilateral treaties that exists right now that, that is making progress. Um, so where does it stand? I mean, even in its uh, nascent stages, we've seen that over, Two thirds of the world has already uh, declared its support for the treaty and is working to bring about um, their ratification to join the treaty. Uh, so far, 68 countries in the world have already managed that. Uh, 92 states have signed it. Um, so there's three other states that have ceded without getting into the legalities of how this all works. We have 95 states that have already taken legal actions to join the treaty. And so we're seeing that already almost half of the UN membership has has joined it. Um, so who hasn't joined it? Let me just, uh, if that's uh, what you're getting at in terms of whether or not it's a reality. Yes, it is true that the TPNW does not so far enjoy the support of the governments of any of the nuclear armed countries or those countries that claim protection from nuclear weapons. And that's that's no surprise to us or to the framers of the treaty. It's it's basically never the case that perpetrators of weapon systems want to lead on bringing about their prohibitions. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, they have, you know, in these countries, we have seen governments build pol entire political systems and economies on this flawed assertion that nuclear weapons are keeping them safe. Uh, I should say that they assert that it's good that they have them and bad that others have them. And that's the entire basis of their uh, security system. So uh, we didn't expect them to come on board first, and it's been over 70 years of countries in the, the vast majority of the world that wants a prohibition on nuclear weapons, uh, a treaty-based prohibition, of them waiting for those states to take the lead and not doing so, that really brought about this process. So um, right now, we are seeing uh, this, again, concrete reality moving forward. We uh, just held the first meeting of the states' parties to this treaty last June in Vienna, and we're going to see the second meeting of states parties to the treaty happen uh, this November in New York. Let me read from the treaty. 
It begins by declaring that the state parties to this treaty determined to contribute to the realization of the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations deeply concerned about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences that would result from any use of nuclear weapons and recognizing the consequent need to completely eliminate such weapons, which remains the only way to guarantee that nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances. And it continues point after point. And then the treaty goes on. Each state party undertakes never under any circumstances to develop, it's very sweeping here, test, produce, manufacture, otherwise acquire, possess or stockpile nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. And also, it says, not only would any state party be prohibited from using nuclear weapons, but also to, quote, threaten to use them. <sighs> what a... Uh, what a complete treaty. I mean, it would create a, a, oh, a, a nuclear weapons-free world, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is true. What you read uh, does uh, accurately describe the core hope prohibitions of the treaty. Um, there's more that uh, isn't mentioned in that that part of the treaty that I, I might, I'd like to highlight if I could. So as you say, the, the TPNW, this is the first and only globally applicable treaty that establishes, as you say, a sweeping or a comprehensive ban on nuclear weapons, anything to do with nuclear weapons, developing them, obtaining them from others, stockpiling them, certainly using them, threatening to use them. It's the only treaty that prohibits threatens, threats to use nuclear weapons, um, as well as uh, assisting others in, in uh, doing any of those prohibited activities. But then second, I should note, because that's the part you described, but second, in addition, in addition it provides a framework for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. So once states that possess nuclear weapons, nuclear armed states, and also those states that host nuclear weapons uh, join this treaty, they are coming into a framework and helping build a framework that will bring about the elimination of their arsenals. And then there's a third component that I'd like to highlight, although there's more we could say, but the TPNW does more than just seek to prevent future harm. It also seeks to address past harm as well. This is the first ever nuclear weapons related treaty that provides its states parties with an obligation to assist people and to uh, remediate environments that are affected by past use and testing of nuclear weapons. And I just, if I just sit on the testing part of that for a moment, you know, a lot of people when asked about past use of nuclear weapons will think only about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But the fact is, that nuclear weapons have been used over 2,000 more times in nuclear weapons tests. And a lot of times our governments, if we are uh, in states that have, you know, one of the nine nuclear armed states, um, they'll be telling us that, you know, they have said in the past, that they've tested in safe ways or tested in, in areas where there were no populations. And it's not true. And, and we've seen how untrue it is in the generations that have uh, that have that have you know that have come come after those that have experienced the, the horrors of nuclear weapons testing. Um, so those tests were done in uh, in places that some that have long forgotten names or or places that we remember for the wrong reasons, like the Bikini Atoll, you know, or something like this, where um, communities lived and uh, and have been either eliminated or uh, displaced or um, are still there, but suffering from the harms of those tests for uh, intergenerational, uh, in, in, you know, for, for many years after, and then, um, and, then, and then descendants of these people are continuing to suffer. So uh, this is just to say that there's a lot more to what the treaty is trying to do uh, than uh, merely uh, prohibit the uh, future use and testing of nuclear weapons. Can you detail how the treaty came about, the, the history of, of, of this treaty? As I said, countries have been, and civil society have been working to 
bring about a prohibition of nuclear weapons ever since nuclear weapons were first used. In fact, the United Nations, the very first General Assembly resolution of the United Nations was tasked with coming up with a solution for the, uh, to prevent the, uh, the, the use of, of atomic energy for war, warring purposes. And uh, so it's been something that the entire diplomatic world has been focused on for their you know, post-war, post-World War II existence. And of course, civil society overwhelmingly has uh, campaigned to bring about. So different, there have been many different routes toward achieving this, uh, but let's just cut to how the one that succeeded or is succeeding now, which is uh, that in uh, ICANN was formed in 2007 and our mission was really to figure out uh, a way to bring about this, this comprehensive prohibition treaty and um, the path toward it it was basically uh, initiated through a, a series of humanitarian uh, consequences conferences that were held in 2013 and 2014 uh, that where states that attended these conferences were uh, basically studied and discussed and eventually declared that uh, any use of nuclear weapons anywhere for any reason would have uh, catastrophic humanitarian consequences for which their governments had no adequate response. A very basic principle, you would think, but it, it took this long for us to have some very clear declaration from that many states that that was the case and that the only solution would be a global prohibition. Uh, so in the next years, we br brought about this open-ended working group at the UN that led to the negotiations for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in 2017. And so, uh, and as I mentioned, it, that, that that treaty was negotiated throughout 2017. It was adopted on July 7th, 2017, and uh, by 122 UN member states, one state voting against. And then uh, in December of that year, ICANN was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize um, for our work to uh, bring attention to the consequences, the humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons, as well as our work to bring about this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Now, as we record uh, this interview, uh, Seth, uh, President Biden just said that Russian President Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons is, this is Biden's word, real, uh, as Russia has now deployed nuclear weapons, so-called tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, right next to uh, to Ukraine. How does that fit in with this, this treaty? The reality is, and those who have true expertise in the subject will always say that we are dangerously close to the, the use of nuclear weapons, that uh, it's always a real and present danger. The fact that any leader, because that's what we're that's what we know is that these weapons uh, are largely in the control of individual leaders or a small circle of leaders in these nine nuclear armed countries. And our entire security system and our entire uh, way of going about our lives is built on this fantasy, really, that these few leaders will remain stable enough at every second of every day not to launch them. So when Biden says that it's a real possibility that uh, Putin could use nuclear weapons, we would say, of course it is. You know, that's going to be the case for as long as we perpetuate a system where it's OK to possess them. And I think that the rhetorical challenge for uh, Biden in this space is that the U.S. Uh, under his leadership and basically under every post-World War II leadership we've had, has found its own way to justify its its own possession of nuclear weapons, and uh, and of course has also used nuclear weapons. In fact, has been the only country that has used nuclear weapons in uh, in conflict, and um, and it's very difficult for them to say that uh, the truth, which is that of course we should be afraid of the use of nuclear weapons, uh, because the U.S. is unfortunately perpetuating a system where 
uh, that values nuclear weapons, that that gives legitimacy to these weapons and makes it very difficult for us to critique other countries for pursuing them. Indeed, the U.S. is involved in this nuclear weapons modernization program today, an incredibly expensive and <laughs> what a dangerous program. Now that you mentioned this, uh, it's, that's a good opportunity for me to plug that last week I can, we released our uh, 2022 report. I don't know if you set me up for this on purpose or saw this, but uh, we just released a new report. It's called Wasted uh, that demonstrates the uh, global nuclear weapon spending in 2022. We do this every year uh, where um, other think tanks and such analyze how many weapons there are in the world. But we like to point out how much money is being spent on those weapons. Uh, and uh, we have tried to track all of the spending from the nine nuclear armed states and found that there's last year they spent um, almost uh, $83 billion on their nuclear weapon systems. Uh, and that's, I think that's $157,000 per minute. If that helps you appreciate how extraordinary that is. But I think for me, what's uh, just as noteworthy is how steadily this number goes up. Um, it's increased $2.5 billion from last year. And last year, it, it went up uh, by several other billions. So it was going up even before the current stage of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. So we can't blame that. It was going up during the pandemic, you know, even when we all conceded and all knew that we had much more important human needs to spend our money on. And the United States, through your original point, what you said first, uh, spent, the United States spent more than all of the other nuclear armed states combined. I think it's something like $44 billion. If you if you live in the US, I think you should, uh, you, you should be aware of how much of your tax dollars are going to perpetuating this problem. I, I'd like to go right to the issue of what can the viewer do to stop it, to, 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 to help put the, uh, the nuclear genie back in the bottle? There's so much you could do. Maybe I'll start right there to segue uh, around the money. You know, uh, I think that uh, after you look at how much money is being spent on nuclear weapons, I would encourage you to check out the PAX Don't Bank on the Bomb report, another annual publication where we document who is producing these weapons and gives you the roadmap for divesting from them. It has spearheaded divestment campaigns around the world. Uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons now makes it illegal to spend money on uh, investing in nuclear weapons uh, companies. So that's really spurring along the divestment process, especially of course in those states that have already joined the treaty. We are talking really only about, according to this report, around two dozen companies that make or maintain these weapons. So when we are pushing for this like divestment campaign, it's not it's not like divesting from fossil fuels, which you know is obviously another uh, a very powerful divestment campaign. Um, but you know, that's a really challenging one, of course, because fossil fuels are so uh, the economy of fossil fuels is so is so challenging. Here it's quite it's quite limited, and so the divestment campaigns are quite targeted. But what else can you do? Um, if if I can go back to to your question, I would say, well, that first of all, that depends on where your viewers are, I guess. Uh, I suppose because I think the actions look different depending on how your government is uh, is involved in this treaty. I guess most of your viewers are in the U.S. I mean, yeah. I would say if you are in a country that's joined the treaty, then congratulations, and we're working with you too and your government to implement the treaty. If you're in a country that supports the treaty, you know that, or maybe assign the treaty, uh, then we're working with your um, government to campaign to get them to join. But if you're in a country like the U.S. that doesn't support the treaty, um, then the work looks a little bit different. It's in a different place. Now, I didn't mention this before, but I guess I should tell you who ICANN is. Uh, and ICANN is this global coalition of non-governmental organizations. Uh, we have a, a staff team that's based in Geneva and I'm uh, in Switzerland and I'm on that staff team, but that's about a dozen people um, the, the campaign is really, it's this, uh, there's over 650 non-governmental organizations in 111 countries right now. So all of these NGOs look different. They have sort of different remits and different scopes and sizes, but they're all united on uh, advocating for 
their country to join or depending on whether they join to implement the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, so uh, you can look for your local partner organization on our website, ICANW.org, and work with them to take the treaty forward. But I would say there's also so much you can do if you don't want to work with an organization but want to do on your own. I mean, even from starting with the conversations you have about nuclear weapons or the news reports you listen to about nuclear weapons, I would say, you know, you should never let anyone tell you a story about nuclear weapons that casts them as these anodyne theoretical instruments of, of state policy, you know, it's like that are just wargaming and, uh, and are only used for their deterrent effects. Uh, these are real weapons that do harm to real people right now. Uh, the policies of your government have humanitarian consequences now and every day. And so I encourage you to learn about that. And that is, as I mentioned, that has that relates in, not just to the, the threats of use that your government may be imposing to destroy, you know, giant pop, civilian populations, but also how they're currently uh, building these weapons, uh, the people who are harmed by the nuclear fuel chain that relates to building these weapons, the people that have been harmed in, uh, for generations from the testing of these nuclear weapons. So I would, if you wanna learn more, I would start by following us, uh, follow ICANN uh, on the socials. We are hashtag nuclear ban, um, but go to our website and sign up. We give regular updates to everyone who's following us. Uh, that's ICANW, I-C-A-N-W dot O-R-G. Uh, read the treaty. Read the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's it's really, I mean, maybe not everyone wants to read treaties, but if you are into that sort of thing, it's it's a really great read. And thank you for reading the beginning of it uh, at the when we're at the top of this uh, discussion. It's federal legislation that supports the TPNW uh, in this 2023 Congress, federal Congress. We have HRS 77, I believe. Yeah, 77 is the McGovern Bill. Uh, that's it's called embracing the goals and provisions of the TPNW. And then there's also HR 2775, which is the Eleanor Holmes Norton bill, uh, the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Conversion Act that also calls on the US to sign and ratify the treaty. So these are things that people who are doing local advocacy <clears throat> can work on. Um, there's of course many divestment campaigns I mentioned that you can look up. Um, maybe one more I could mention if you're a student or if you're going to school, I, I encourage you to check out uh, our quite innovative, and I think because no one else had done this research really quite as comprehensively, um, our we have a, another report called Schools of Mass Destruction. Uh, it's focused on the U.S. in this case. It highlights the 50 U.S. universities that are working on nuclear weapons. They work to manufacture nuclear weapons, maintain our nuclear weapon systems, and help students and alumni and faculty know what their school is doing to, in some cases, they directly manage the laboratories that design nuclear weapons. In some cases, they're part of the, the you know, the, 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 the jobs pipeline to the nuclear weapons industry. Uh, and a lot of this information is purposefully kept secret from students and faculty. So we've been working to uncover it and help people uh, sort of find a way to do advocacy around getting their schools out of the nuclear weapons industry. So there's just a few of the things that we're working on uh, for people that, you know, aren't, uh, that are looking to just act locally could do. What a wonderful uh, menu of all the things that people can and, and should do. The media, now I, I've been a journalist all my, my profession, all my working life. I'm a journalism professor. There has been, it seems to me, a real failure of the, the media in the United States, if not most of the world, or much of the world, to, uh, I mean, if, if you ask people in the United States about this treaty to eliminate nuclear weapons, if one out of a thousand knows about it, I kind of would be surprised, like, what is going on? You're asking me? That's the question yep. I would put to you. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, this, now we're in your expertise, if, and, and this is really, you know, I, I think a confounding problem for all of us and if I had to guess, but you tell me, I mean, I see this as a problem of myopic framing. You know, the fact that journalists tend to take uh, a very narrow view of current events and not frame it in terms of long-term uh, perspective harm or a perspective that looks at, you know, past, past uh, sort of 
you know, how things came about from a really uh, thoughtful and, and, and long uh, arc. They just look at what's here and now and they listen to what they consider to be the authorities. But, you know, I think that's in some cases, you know, I guess that's the nature of the industry. That's the way people are changed, trained, but it's it's a real problem. I think like how, the, for instance, I think about how how this tendency among journalists perhaps contributed to the ongoing climate crisis. Like how long did it take for journalists to accept that there were not two sides to the climate crisis, that just because industry experts, you know, who have an obvious bias thought that we're, we're saying for decades and producing reports for decades that this is not a man-made problem. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're right. And that doesn't mean that uh, a, a thoughtful and uh, journalist should not really, you know, give, give, give more time to someone who actually has the other view. Um, and I think that this, like the climate crisis, even more so is this very black and white issue where it, and we we find ourselves in this classic case of asking for solutions uh, from the same people who perpetuate the problem. You know, continuing to ask for the right answers from the people who are repeatedly wrong. What our movement, uh, just to close this thought, is what our movement has demonstrated is is that the real experts are are not those people, not those people that journalists have turned to for so long for explanations, like the political and military strategists that are perpetuating this dangerous status quo based on unproven game theory. The real experts are those who truly understand the consequences and their impact on society, like the scientists who know what nuclear weapons do to destroy our environment, doctors, the aid agencies that know that there's in reality no humanitarian response, no matter what your government tells you. And perhaps most of all, the victims of nuclear weapons use development, testing people who are suffering and have suffered uh, from disproportionately affecting marginalized communities disproportionately, affecting global south countries disproportionately, and affecting women and children disproportionately. Thank Those you. are the people we should be interviewing. Thank you so much, Seth, for your work. And the, the acronym of ICANN is uh, meaningful in another way. We can, we can, if we all work together in this country, around the world, to to eliminate, to abolish nuclear weapons. I mean, after World War I, with uh, well, the, the horrific consequences of the use of chemical weapons in World War I, uh, the world got together in the 1920s, early 30s to outlaw chemical weapons. I mean, the same can happen and must happen, should happen with nuclear weapons. I mean, nuclear war, it's madness, it's suicide, it, it's nuclear annihilation, and it must be prevented, it must be avoided, nuclear weapons must be eliminated. Thanks so much, Seth, and thank you for watching. Thank you very much for having me, and I agree. <laughs>